I'll give you a little, uh, little context on, on uh, where I'm coming from. So Turner um, has been uh, more by, I'd say, uh, by accident than design, I hate to, hate to admit, uh, a leader in, in the use of BIM. You know, we, we started uh, six, seven years ago on the west coast of the U.S., hospital projects in particular. It was a, it was a new technology. We saw the designers uh, starting to model. We, we said, well, you know, how can we take advantage of it? And as, as innovation typically happens, it was very grassroots, you know, just people trying it out on, on projects. And then uh, it, it was recognized uh, probably about five, six years ago as, as really game-changing or, or potential, having the potential for game-changing uh, impact on the company. So I, I was, uh, by coincidence, in between some assignments and, and uh, was very interested in, in, in uh, BIM and, and uh, what I saw. So I, I jumped in, started taking on some responsibilities uh, in our New York office and then nationally. And in that time, we've, uh, we've had a tremendous amount of growth in the, uh, in the adoption of BIM. And, and, and what's interesting about this, and I, I don't point this out to boast necessarily, but to, to highlight that this all, uh, our, our growth, you know, up to over 600 projects now, what are 40 plus billion uh, of uh, work that's either completed or, or ongoing, w was all uh, all happening without any sort of a mandate. You know, we've never mandated that you must use BIM. It was, it was and it continues to be very grassroots. If, if its value is proven, then people will, will, uh, will use it, and, and uh, that, that value has been uh, proven time and again. But, but what's interesting is that uh, where, where we are now is more, you know, we're getting to that point where we sort of saturated the basics, and now, it, now we're, we're looking forward, and, and how do we advance? And so I want to talk quite a bit about that. So again, the, that history is uh, it, you, all well known to you, but uh, for us it was, it was an interesting thing because I think BIM in particular, uh, you know, for, for an industry that is very focused or very, very, very uh, sort of uh, locked into tradition and, and, and uh, the way of doing things, you know, the same way for years and years, BIM really sort of woke people up and said, wow, you know, there are better ways. We, we can... Uh, do, do things uh, uh, you know, with new technologies and get better results. And so it really was a, 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 an eye-opener, a sort of a door-opener for, for a lot of people in the company. And uh, that's led to um, uh, quite, a, quite a, you know, an interest in, in its broad application and, and as well as related technologies. It's almost the, this, um, this uh, you know, sort of tsunami of, of, of technology that's flooding us now that, that everybody's sort of uh, looking around saying, what, what, are, what are the tools can we use? And so what, what we see is clearly that there are as everyone here knows, there's many uses for BIM. Um, what, what I think the, uh, and, and you know, we've, we've I think hit most uh, of the basic ones for our company, you know, the trade coordination. This is actually an example, I, I went back a little bit in time, but this is one of the first big ones for us probably four or five years ago, which was Yankee Stadium, the new Yankee Stadium. And that was, uh, that was uh, you know, the first large project that we'd ever applied uh, BIM for coordination in particular. You know, really changed the marketplace in New York City because we, we were able to uh, really leverage a job of that size and that sa uh, sort of signature uh, nature of you know, being $1.2 billion uh, to, to really change the marketplace. And so that was, that was, a, that was a, a real start for us as a company. And, and then we've, again, continued to refine that and, uh, and develop metrics and such around coordination then migrated sort of naturally into scheduling and, and um, you know, this is an example of, of one, a recent one for a job in, in Kuala Lumpur. It's a 118 story tower that uh, we modeled uh, all the site work, uh, all the, all the uh, sort of the logistics of, uh, of the uh, construction and, and the sequence as well. And it was a fairly extensive effort because we, we actually got a, uh, we got a model out of an architect in, uh, in Australia, which was an Archicad. And so we sort of struggled with that a little bit because that's not as common. Uh, but subsequently built this uh, r very detailed schedule. And uh, so that's, that's you know, fairly bread and butter. You know, at least that's basic sequencing, same thing with logistics and safety planning. This example in uh, New York City of, uh, of one of our projects, which is the uh, New York University Medical Center, the Langone development. It's a, I think it's running now about a $2 billion uh, redevelopment on the east, east side of Manhattan. Very extensive, uh, very difficult uh, conditions, so everything's modeled uh, to, a, to a high level of detail for logistics. And actually, um, we also worked with uh, the city of New York on developing uh, BIM-based uh, submission plans for, for their site safety review. When, uh, to de prior to this, they had uh, they'd mostly been working in 2D, and, and then, uh, in fact, actually, uh, one of the gentlemen who's gonna talk tomorrow, uh, Tyler Goss, was, uh, was instrumental in, in, uh, in that effort, working with the city of New York and the Department of Buildings and coming up with this BIM-based plan. So it was, uh, it was, it was a you know, pretty, uh, pretty intensive effort, but, but again, the, that logistics and safety planning is pretty, pretty standard. Uh, you, estimating, 
uh, you know, we've started branching out over the years. Now we're starting to tackle, okay, how do you, how do you really, um, how do you integrate BIM into the estimating process? And, you know, we've had uh, sort of fits and starts. Uh, you know, it, I have a fairly high standard for BIM for estimating, which is that it's truly integrated as part of the process that the estimators are using the model. They're extracting the quantities in an organized way. There, okay, we sort of, uh, we haven't fully integrated this yet into the estimating process. It's a bit of a struggle. And then uh, the other push, so we went upstream, now we're going downstream, is also working on you know, a solution for facilities management. This is an example of, of a, um, a software that we actually worked with a third party in, in, uh, in, in guiding the development. So it's, uh, it's taking the model and uh, it's linking uh, all the documentation to the model, but also we, we, we sort of uh, achieved what I call the holy grail of BIM, which is linking into the sensor data. So we're, we got a server and connected into the, into the uh, into the actual uh, uh, control system through BACnet protocol, and we're streaming all the all the sensor data out and, and linked into the model, so you can click on an object and see, you know, whatever the temperature, humidity of, of that piece of equipment or the room or what have you. So it's uh, a pretty, pretty, pretty amazing, pretty, pretty advanced uh, solution. But uh, what's interesting is, is uh, you know, there's a lot of things you can do, uh, but the, the challenge is, you know, sort of guiding it providing direction, otherwise you, you risk, you know, this, this effect of, you know, this out of control, you know, you're innovating for innovation's sake, or you're changing for change's sake, but to what end, you know, and it actually can be quite dangerous if you, if you start running around saying, oh, look at all the things I can do with BIM, you know, it's a, uh, it, it, it can cause trouble. So what I wanted to talk about today was this sort of framework, and it's purely my perspective on this, uh, based on having lived through this growth of BIM and and also, I'm responsible for uh, for uh, uh, lean implementation and, and uh, IPD, you know, project alliancing type agreements. And what's become clear is this, is this, you know you really have to there's, there's multiple elements to the successful um, uh, sort of capitalizing and leveraging on on these innovations like BIM, which are really focusing on people, the process, and and the purpose why you're doing this. The and the key I think is when you're talking about people, is to realize you know. You, know, you have all those uses of BIM, you have 3D, 4D, 5D, which are, they're, they're nouns, right? They're, they're, uh, they're things versus using BIM as a verb and for action, for, for enough, you know, to do something to something to get a, a result. And you know, for, for a, an, to try to get to a goal that you're trying to accomplish, it's, it's an action uh, tool. It, and otherwise, you risk this, this issue where you know, sort of the, um, what do they call it, the, the law of the instrument, that you know, if, if you've got a hammer, everything looks like a nail. You know, BIM, I, I notice that a lot with BIM, we get trapped in that, this, this idea, well, we've got this solution, and it's looking for a problem. Let's go try to apply it to something, versus the other way around, flip it around. What's the problem? Where, what are we trying to solve? You know, what, what, are the, what are the struggles? Um, what are the, what are the struggles that everybody is dealing with every day? What are the pain points? What are the problems? What are the things we want to improve? How do we help people uh, get their job done better? And you go back to that example of facilities management. It's a classic. You know, we, we, uh, that solution I showed you, we, we uh, deployed it up at, um, I'm, trying to, I'm debating whether I should tell you the name of the, where we, well, at, at a large educational institution in, in Manhattan. Uh, we, we actually delivered that solution. Uh, they installed it on, on 10 different machines for the facilities managers, and that was about a year and a half ago. I think since then, we've maybe had one person look at it. You know, the facilities guys, you know, we, we said, oh, well, it's, it's their fault, right? It's them. It's them. It's not us. It's a beautiful solution. That, it's got all the information in the model. It's got all linked. It's got all the sensor data. Who wouldn't want that? It's beautiful. But, you know, you think about that guy who gets up every day, you know, the, the, the facilities guy he gets up in the morning. He goes to work, he's got two things to do. He's either fixing something or he's maintaining something. And so when he goes out and changes that filter, how does that help him do that better? It doesn't, you know, you know and he's keeping track of maintenance information, probably doing it on an Excel spreadsheet. I mean, any, our, our CIO once told me this, and this, I, I've never forgotten it because it's so true. Every solution always competes with Excel. It, it, it's true, anything, you know, because that's the easiest, quickest tool. And that's what people tend to use and they default to that. So, you know, when we're looking at these solutions, again, when we're thinking about it from, oh, this seems logical, why wouldn't they want this? You've got to flip it around and start thinking from the, that people perspective. Well, what are they doing every day? How are they doing it? Where are they struggling? How do you help them do their job better? And then instead of a push, you know, I've got a solution look, looking for a problem, 
you know, it's a pull. Here's the problem. Now let's go get the solution for it. And then you get this whole life cycle of, and, and all these parties to this process that we, we, we need to uh, r really start to drill down more around the people and the jobs they're doing every day. And then the only other overlay I would add to it is, is this idea of, you know, at some point you, you have to recognize that you know, there is so much that you can do with BIM to, you know, level, levels of detail that are, you know, as much as you want, you know, cove basing, door, door uh, hardware, whatever. But, you know, there's, with anything, there's trade-offs. Life is, is you know, we're not, we're not blessed with infinite resources. We, we have to have trade-offs. So given the cost or the effort, is the return there. So you have to overlay that as well when we're looking at, okay, what, are we, what problems are we solving? What are we trying to do? And how are we trying to do it? So I'll give you some examples of those sort of, um, sort of the, the very uh, more targeted use of BIM for problem solving. And what I also want to I'll highlight is also the, the, um, the tools that we're using, because again, they're not, uh, they're not the same for every solution. We're, we're, we sort of an unofficial uh, policy uh, of trying not to be very ideolo ideological or dogmatic about software. You know, use the best tool for the task at hand. That's it. Find, and whatever that tool is, use it. Here's a perfect example, World Trade Center Transportation Hub. It's a, I don't know, it's running probably around a $4 billion project, maybe, maybe five, and we may never know for the next 10 years what, it's, what the final cost is gonna be, but it just keeps going. So it's a, it's a tough, it's a, in everyone's defense, it's a tough site to, to build. Uh, so this, the Transportation Hub sits right at the middle in the World Trade Center uh, site. Every, every project that uh, is there connects into the hub. And then you've got the path, the, the, the uh, train coming in, the subway coming in. And so it's a very complex site, very complex project. And it's very complex design, this uh, Santiago Calatrava design. What's interesting is we, got, we were engaged on that project uh, probably three, four years ago. We immediately, or almost immediately, put uh, a BIM person down there full time. So we started trying to play with, okay, how, you know, we got Calatrava's design in 2D, which is fine. But, so we had to... We had to immediately wanted to convert that to 3D. And we had to find the, the best tool for that. We played with ArchiCAD, we played with Revit, um, I don't know, even Bentley, and all sorts of different tools. We ended up with SketchUp. You know, amazingly enough, we ended up with SketchUp. And, and I've, I've, uh, I've mentioned that to people, and, and some, some, there's some folks have you know, very, uh, very sort of rigid orthodoxy around this, and they say, well, that's not, that doesn't count, it's not BIM. And, and, and that, to me, that's, again, that narrow definition of a software versus BIM as a problem-solving tool. You know, or, and a verb, a, you know, it's, it's an action you're taking to do something better. And so this helps us do this better. We, we were doing hundreds of little models every day. A superintendent would come over and say, I don't understand, what am I doing over here tomorrow or today? Where's that crane gonna go? How do I connect and how do I, am I coordinating with the work that's adjacent? They had to figure these things out every single day. The fastest tool, quickest, easiest tool we could use was a SketchUp. And it was tremendously, uh, tremendously helpful and, and, and useful. And we had, we had two, two people, at least two people full-time down there through, I think it was last year, and then it started tapering off a little bit. Here's another example of a, of a use of, uh, a very targeted use. It's, it's an, sort of an interesting one. Fairly recent, we, you know, we, had the, we have this uh, large project, the Wilshire Grand Hotel in uh, Los Angeles, and they, they have a huge mat, uh, mat slab, and so they wanted to, they wanted to use this as an opportunity to beat the Guinness Book of World Records for the largest mat slab pour. And so uh, they did something very interesting. They modeled everything they could imagine that was going to go into that job. Well, they first laser scanned the, the, the hole, then they modeled the, the rebar, there's a cooling system cause, to keep the concrete uh, down, the temperature down, all, this, all the little uh, steel um, shoring, even the shoring, I mean, everything was modeled. And then, and then they, they placed the, you know, the concrete and then they, they deducted for all those things that were modeled so that they get an accurate count or an accurate volume of the, uh, of the um, actually I'll go back, of the, uh, of the concrete. So what's, uh, what's interesting is that it was, um, uh, I'll have to try to think if I can do the math of the, uh, the, uh, the cubic meters, but it was, uh, the, the, the tar I'll give it in cubic yards at least. The, the target was, uh, the Guinness Book of World Records was uh, uh, 21,000 cubic yards of, of concrete was the previous record. We, were, we modeled everything we came up with. The, the, ca the quantity being that we'd need would be 21,240 cubic yards. And then the actual concrete that was poured was 21,200. So you know, from, uh, we had a difference of, of what was modeled and estimated of 21,240 versus 21,200. So it was a difference of 0.2% from the actual to the estimate. I mean, unbelievably accurate. And though it was for a, a you know, sort of a, you know, a purpose that you wouldn't expect, this, this uh, sort of uh, recognition in the Guinness Book of World Records, 
you, what you also start to see with this is, given that, how do you, you know, where's that, how do you capitalize on this for, for, for a business purpose, this accuracy? And, and so it starts, to, uh, it starts to get also our people thinking more about how the trusting in the, in the, uh, in the, uh, the product. So here's another example of just simple things that we're doing, again, to make it easier uh, and solve simple problems. You know, estimators, again, 5D estimating, we could, we could take quantities off of a Revit model all day long, but I don't really hold that as our standard. Our standard is, again, integrating it with the estimating process. So average estimators are using the, uh, the tools and, and take advantage of models. So, you know, the simplest on-ramp is like a SketchUp. So we built a little plugin, in-house plugin for, for uh, SketchUp where you can, you can, um, you can um, use material properties and then use that to organize all your quantities. And very basic, and you'd say, oh, it's sort of childish. I mean, there's much more sophisticated solutions out there, and we know that. We, we use pretty much all of them. We, we own them all, unfortunately. Uh, but at the end of the day, you've got, you got to think about that estimator, that, that you know, I don't know, 50-year-old estimator, senior estimator has been doing it a whole life, same way, hand takeoffs. You know, to give him, you know, the Ferrari of, uh, of BIM estimating, you know, he'll never get it out of the driveway, so why even try, you know? So we, we give him a little simple thing. Hey, what, how about SketchUp, and you get some basic quantities for your massing and generating some things. And that's easy, it's approachable. You know, it's not, uh, it's not anxiety inducing. They have to figure out all this new software. It, it's, it's, it's basic. Same thing with, uh, you know, when you start to escalate that a little bit, another plugin uh, that we uh, developed in-house, uh, which is just getting your quantity, sort of bi-directional quantities out of, uh, uh, out and, and then back into uh, Revit or Navisworks via Excel. Again, why fight the Excel uh, you know, uh, bias? Use it, take advantage of it. Let, let them work in Excel, but then go back and forth with the quantities and organize it in a way that they, they, uh, they can use them. Oh, <laughs> there's the Wilshire Grand. Out of sequence. So here's say another example of the um, the uh, of the use of the BIM for a very specific purpose, which is a, an office tower in New York. It's the Seven Bryant Park. This one very specifically was around. You know, it was a very uh, it was a uh, uh, thick uh, concrete core going up through the building. They had a lot of penetrations, and when we got the design models, um, you know, I hate, hate to say it, but they weren't. Uh, fully coordinated with the shear wall. And so we ended up going back in, making sure that we, all the penetrations were coordinated. We found a lot of issues that we wouldn't have otherwise caught if, we, if not for BIM. And so there's a you know, projected savings, just uh, sort of uh, cost avoidance of, of uh, the, at the first, first pass is $328,000, but that's only for a limited area of the building. We actually then subsequently went through the rest of the building and found more issues. So you know, it's probably $500,000, $600,000 just in that special study that we did alone with the, uh, just the uh, coordinating the, the shear wall uh, penetrations. Another example of, uh, of a project, big stadium project in San Francisco, where we had the utility, uh, coordinating utilities with foundations, uh, 9,200 meters of plumbing pipe and 69,000 meters of electrical conduit. Uh, it, and we had to uh, coordinate that with 3,000 uh, piles that were, that were uh, being uh, drilled. So, you know, uh, tr very specialized use of BIM because that was a problem that the, uh, that the uh, project manager, project superintendents were grappling with, is, the, is not just the coordination but the sequence as well because they had all this work, you know, the, the uh, utilities it, it, sort of weaving in and out of the, uh, of the piles. And then uh, again, another example of that specialized use, uh, using a software, uh, Celebri, which uh, where we built uh, as, as an effort on behalf of an architect actually in California. We took their model and ran it through a code checking uh, exercise using Celebri with building a bunch of, converting the, the building code or, or the, the uh, uh, what they call Oshpod code um, uh, in, into uh, rules and then running them through the model so that you could see you know, where, where things are, are out of compliance. So you, you know, the, the image at the bottom is the, is the turn radius of a wheelchair in a bathroom. So there's a certain radius you have to have. If, you know, we had a model that had all those, uh, the fixtures and the space, and we run a rule and say, can a wheelchair turn in that space? If it can't, we've got to redesign that bathroom. And so we flagged all those, all those places in, in the model that were out of compliance. And it was interesting, because we did that on behalf of the architect. Normally, this isn't a place that we would sort of play, because it's more on the design side. But it was a, it was a need. The, the, you know, the requirements in California are very, very stringent. When you submit, you know, if, if it's not right, it gets rejected, and you have to start the process all over again. So we wanted to get it right the first time. So it, we extended that then next to, uh, to this effort to, uh, to uh, try to take a lot of our safety rules and, uh, and, and, and automate those as well. So again, if you've got a model and, and you've got the, uh, the safety managers have all this sort of knowledge in their head about what they're looking at when they're walking a job, well, in, in reality, what's in their head it can be converted into a rule. 
if this condition, then this. You know, it's, it's simple sort of uh, conditional statements. So we, you uh, set up a rule and then you run it through, uh, again, Salibri, uh, you, and it kicks out results. So for instance, this is an example of uh, where it's, just, it's highlighting the slab opening. So you gotta have, you gotta perimeter protection. So we're, you know, we're flagging ahead of time to the safety people as well as our staff. Look, you, you know, the, these areas you're gonna have to plan for, you have to buy the protection from, from the trades or, or, or provide it ourselves. And it, it's just an automated product. This one's uh, checking you know, distances of uh, fire extinguishers. And because in New York, this is New York City in particular has uh, some uh, strict requirements. So again, the, the idea is how do we leverage uh, BIM? You know, none of that sort of fits into a nice neat category, 4D, 5D, whatever. It, it's, it's more about using it to, to uh, help people do their jobs better, free people up from, from the tasks that aren't real value add and so they can focus on delivering greater value to uh, to our clients and and, uh, and to our own uh, our own staff. So it's a uh, it's a very conscious effort on our part to take uh, to look at BIM in a, in a very different way. What's interesting, though, with all that being said, right? It sounds so simple. Well, we just help you. We go around. And we say, hey, we're going to help you do your job better. Well, it still doesn't mean we don't get stiff armed quite a bit, you know, because you know it's a, it's an interesting thing that. Uh, People are, um, if it weren't for people, everything would be so easy. <laughs> you know? So I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do an exercise. Uh, I, I need, who, has, uh, who has pen and paper? How many people have pen and paper? A few, few? Good. Okay, so for the ones that do, and even the ones that don't, you can still follow along on this one and, and try to imagine it. So I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to do a little exercise. So I want, uh, I want you to write the, the words Turner Construction Company. Just write it in, in two seconds. I'll, and, I'll, and when you're done writing it, I want you, uh, want you to tell me when you're done. Uh, raise your hand. Whoever's got the pen and paper, you got everybody write it out. And then raise your hand. I want, to take an average, I want to take an average count of how long it takes you to do that. You're already done? Well, that's fast. Okay. So uh, I didn't even you need my watch. It's, it's so five, six seconds. So flip your paper over so that you're not looking at it again. And, and to, when I tell you to go, do it again, and then raise your hand. So hold on. Everybody flipped your paper over so you can't see what you wrote. So write it again, Turner Construction Company. So, okay, seven, eight seconds, something like that. Okay, flip your paper over. Now, what I'm gonna do is we're gonna make everything so much easier for you. We're gonna get half the effort, right? Half the effort. So I want you to, I want you to write, when I say go, I want you to write Turner Construction Company, but every other letter. Every other letter. So ready? Go. And think about, as you're doing that, try to think about what you're sort of feeling as you're going through that. Much more diversity of, uh, of results here. Okay, so let's... 18, 19 seconds. So, I want, you, can, you can run this scenario forever, but the inter what's interesting, right? I did this myself. You can try it again, try it, try it if, you, if you want to. This, it's fascinating, because this is what I did this once on a, on a, I was on a plane, and uh, you know, this is what I do on planes. <laughs> the people next to me are like, what, are you, what, the, what is this nut job doing? So, you know, I, I timed myself, did the same thing, ran it out, okay, do it first time, turn a construction company, run it out, but, you know, you'd see the blue line, that's the, that's the original. Okay, fine, I'm, I'm, you know, gets a little bit better, but not dramatic improvement. The green line is then, you, okay, every other letter. Okay, it sounds so simple. Well, I'm just going to have you do it a different way, it's, and it's half the effort. But, but what happens is, it, you, you, it's, it, as everybody who, who just did that, you'll probably notice that you're, you're well, at least for me, my brain was hurting. It literally hurts, right? You, you literally have to think about it. And you're like, what? And, and, but, but what's interesting is, okay, yeah, it's harder, it's harder, but then it gets better, and then eventually it gets better than, you, you're faster than even when you first did it. You, eventually you get, uh, you, you really just burn it into your brain. What's interesting is, and I, I, I mention this because it speaks to uh, an issue that sort of holds us back, which is just behavior change. And, it's, and we tend to blame people. I know, you know I hate to, hate to use... Uh, uh, New York is an example, but it's always a good, uh, it's always a good punching bag. You know, it's a tough market in New York, and uh, the construction industry is a little rough, and, and, and you know, uh, the politest way to describe it is very traditional, you know, very, doesn't like to change much. And uh, often we get into this, uh, I see our folks, they get into this uh, 
mindset that well, it's just because everybody's a knucklehead and they don't they're not they don't they don't get what we're trying to get them to do and why it's better and blah blah. But in reality, what, what we have to recognize is that in fact, it's not necessarily that uh, people are knuckleheads. Although there, there are there are a fair number of those too. Uh, but uh, it, it, more so, it's, it's that we're literally biologically designed to, uh, to not change. Our, our brain uses, I think it's like 20% of our, uh, uh, you know, makes up, uh, it takes up 20% of our calories in, in, in any given day, but it makes up whatever, 5% of our body mass. I mean, we've got a ton of energy that the brain uses to think. And it's, and it's, it's evolved to see patterns, lock down patterns, and, and just stick to those and not have to keep thinking about new ways of doing things. So it wants to do things the same way. It's, that's, the, that's the evolutionary advantage of, of not, not having to consume more energy in thinking. So you, the synopses get, get hardwired and to do a certain way. And when you do something new, you have to break those connections. And it takes time and it takes practice. That's that whole curve, when that, that green line of, OK, it took me seven, eight times, then I got better because I'm literally rewiring my brain to do things differently. And so I, I, I mentioned this, it seems, uh, you know, it's not, uh, that's certainly not a sexy uh, BIM image, uh, but I mentioned it because it's so critical to um, the adoption of, of any innovation is, this, is the recognition of, of the people who are having to live through that change. It is disruptive. Now, I have a, my good example is we've got new phones in our office and, and uh, for, for years, the, uh, the, the mute button, button was on the right and, and the, uh, the, the speaker button for hanging up was on the left. It switched, the new phone switched, right? Simple thing. <laughs> I, to this day, it's been probably three months, I, every time, uh, when I, I'm on mute and I, I quickly, when I'm, when I'm not thinking and I go to hit the button so I wanna talk because I'm on mute, I hang up because I'm hitting the wrong button. I keep hitting, it's on the wrong side and I keep hanging. And it's always a kicker because it's at the moment when I actually do wanna talk, I hang up. <laughs> I'm like, oh, <laughs> I think they did that deliberately. <laughs> So the, uh, but it's interesting, right? I, simple thing, little buttons change, but my brain is so wired to the way it was always done that it's hard to, it's hard to change that and it takes practice. So what, the, the next element that I wanna to, uh, to talk about is, is then you know, creating a process to, um, to, to make and sustain change. Because again, all things being equal, habit kicks in, people wanna do things the same way. How do you keep advancing? How do you, how do you uh, improve and, and innovate over time? And so, you, you, I'm sure you've probably seen this, uh, this embarrassing slide that we often show in, uh, you know, in the US. I'm sure this is nothing like this in, in, in Australia. You know, it's a, you know, that productivity trends in construction in that red line, that a flat, you know, flat line for 40 years, we've not increased our productivity. Uh, all of their industries are in that blue line, almost doubled uh, productivity. So, you know, it, it is an embarrassing thing, but it's interesting. I, you know, we see that a lot, and there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of reasons that you could attribute to that uh, flat line. Here's my, my take on it. So, I, again, actually, when I think about it, I was on a plane again when I did this. I get my best work done on planes. The... Um, this is a little, little uh, uh, Excel spreadsheet and a chart I created once, because I, I had this theory, I said, well, what, what if that flat line and then is really a function of this, uh, this failure to learn, that, that we, failure to establish uh, sort of those baselines, improve upon those and build on them. So that compounding effect of continuous improvement. So what you see really quickly there on the, on the left-hand side is, is this uh, sort of uh, the, the you know, year zero to 40, uh, the first column is, is not learning. So it's sort of a random thing, you know, and the baseline being 100. You know, w one year we, we improve to, I don't know, 1%, but then the next year we go back 2%, next year is 5% plus, and then next year is minus three. You know, sort of bum, 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 I bounce around. The, the, the column next to that is, well, what if, you like, like putting a dollar in the bank, you know, the next year it's a dollar 10, and then, and then I, you know, interest on top of that becomes a dollar, I don't know, 15. Interest on top of that becomes a dollar 25. Interest. So the key being, every year I don't take the money out of the bank. I keep it there. I lock it in. That becomes the new baseline. I build on that. I build on that. I build on that. Well, that's the red line. It's the compounding effect. That if I can establish that every year, that lock in the improvement and then build on that, you get this dramatic increase. By the end of year 40, it's a 700% increase from from that uh, the base year. So. To me, it's, it's our, you know, there's a root cause here is, is our inability to, or a lack of a, sort of that, that uh, process uh, for improving, the, for, for establishing the simple cause and effect. You know, that 
which is, you know, I often joke that it feels sometimes like we operate as an industry and it's like Victorian era medicine with leeches and vapors and such, you know. We do things and we don't really know is it, what, what made things better? We, so we just keep doing all of it, hoping that some, some, somewhere in there, there's something that did make things better. What, what we're trying to get to more, and I see the need for it more and more, is this much more scientific approach that you, that you, you, you uh, it's like my, my, my uh, third grade son was learning this, right? Scientific method. You have a hypothesis, you test your hypothesis, you check your results. If the results don't match, you go back and you adjust your hypothesis and you start that process over. In the lean world, it's called PDCA or, or PDSA, plan, do, study, adjust, or, or act. Um, it's, it's, but all, all it is is really simple, is really, really looking for the cause and effect. I do this, did I get a better result? If I didn't, then I go back and I, and I, and I check and I adjust what I thought. And BIM, BIM and, and just generally technology and innovation um, it is, is very uh, difficult to discern uh, the, its impact if you don't have a very systematic, methodical way of applying it. And we, do, we try to do that as much as we can, I know, in-house, and we don't do it nearly as much as I'd like, where we, we're trying those different tools, we're, we're applying them in very specific ways, saying, okay, what is that, what do we think we're going to see when we use BIM for this purpose? Did we see that result? So that we can start to say, yeah, you know what, we're going to, that's good, let's, let's make that the standard, then let's move forward. And so what, what we're trying to get to is this, um, is this idea of, again, this PDCA cycle, this continuous improvement, where you, you make something better, you prove that it's better, you lock it in, that becomes the standard, the, that wedge in the graphic, and then you, you innovate to, to find new ways to improve that. So you're not done, you're never done. You just keep trying to get better and better. And, and my mantra is better before perfect. You know, it's a sort of a, a derivation of, uh, of the, uh, you know, don't let the perfect be the enemy good enough. It's, it's too easy to imagine, especially with, I've noticed with, with technology in particular, because we get so wrapped up in, in technology, I was looking for that silver bullet, that panacea, that, that, that perfect thing is going to be right around the corner, let's just wait, let's just wait. It never comes. It, you know, it's, it's not about the technology. It, it, it's, it's about the people, it's about the process. You make those better, and then you find the solution that, that, uh, that supports that. And so you, you also have to have this methodical way of, of approaching it so that uh, every year you're getting a little bit better and, uh, and you know that you're getting better. So I'll, I'll click through, because again, process is not an easy one to show. So I will, uh, I will show more results though. And this is a little bit of a, almost a, a bit of a chronological order in some of the early BIM jobs uh, that, that BIM and, and some, uh, you know, some aspects of, of continuous improvement being applied to the project as well, and the results that we got. So this, is, uh, this job is a Nintendo headquarters four or five years ago, I think it was, that we uh, completed it. Uh, you know, full, you know, really maxed out on, on BIM. You can see there's a crane optimization study, a lot of prefab, a lot of modular, you know, lots of just-in-time deliveries, uh, that sort of thing, you know, where we accelerate the schedule three months, uh, less labor on site, dramatically less labor on site, more because it was being pushed, uh, you know, a lot of offsite. Productivity was dramatically higher, and we returned seven percent of uh, of seven percent of a uh, of a two hundred million dollar budget was returned to the owner of savings. I mean, really. Quite dramatic. I remember this was the eye-opener job for me when I visited. I'm like, wow. And you can start to see that recipe. All of a sudden, it's not like random. Oh, we're doing a bunch of these things. It's like, okay, you do these things, you get results. And then, and then what, what was interesting to watch as I, as I saw other jobs coming online is that same sort of recipe, not just BIM, but it's BIM uh, in, a, in this continuous improvement framework, this, this process of improvement. Um, and, and then for, uh, for, for, for great results. Again, Middle Tennessee Medical Center probably three, four years ago. Uh, Three million dollar GM, the GMP, the guaranteed maximum price, was, was significantly below the owner's budget. We returned four million in savings. Again, on-site labor uh, savings ahead of schedule. So one of the first times we started seeing electrical prefab, that was always one of those trades that you, I wondered, you know, how, how do they take advantage of it? But you can see in this case they were doing a lot of prefab of their, their conduit and, and, uh, and junction boxes off-site, palletizing them, shipping them. They saved, you know, again, 40 percent labor savings for them. Uh, first example I've seen at that time was uh, of you know, the trades working on top of the deck, using you know the total stations, off, t taking the points off their model, laying out the hangers ahead of time from on top of the deck, drilling down and, and then dropping them, then pouring the deck. Much safer, much more productive. You know, much, with BIM you have this accuracy, and then you have the labor savings. That's that's the result. So you, you could clearly see BIM again enabling a better process, a better a better uh, a better way of doing their job, and a safer way of doing the job, and getting better results. Another, another uh, University of Kentucky. This was an interesting one because, again, from an elect electrician standpoint, that picture in the lower left, so this is a, um, 
it's an electrician who probably had like a 20, 25 million dollar uh, electrical package. You know, it's a, it was about a 200 million, 250 million dollar project. Never had a, uh, a, a conduit bender on site the whole time. Never, never once. They bent every, every piece of their conduit was bent off site in their shop, and it was all shipped in never larger than a shipment that, that exceeded the back, uh, the, the, the uh, size of that trailer in the back of his pickup truck. So in a $20, $25 million package, everything was delivered to the site from that back of that little, little pickup truck. And so it was all these little, again, nice, this concept of, of small batches, uh, flow, you know, just trying to, just in time, just get the materials there, only the materials we need when we need them. Uh, Owensboro is, uh, again, it was a few years, probably two or three years ago, um, another, another example of, uh, of that sort of maximizing the, the, uh, the enabling technology of BIM for improving how people are doing things, prefabricated head walls and, and you know, the panelized exterior wall is pretty, that's, that's not uh, as uh, unusual, but then the, the, uh, the mechanical contractor doing this sort of kit of parts type approach, uh, you know, putting, uh, putting all his uh, ductwork in, in, you know, bagged and, and, and put it into a, into a container that uh, gets shipped to the site and then just gets rolled, everything on wheels, everything just rolled onto the, onto the job. Uh, another example of that, but uh, about the same time, but what was interesting, I wanted to highlight this one because n not just the, uh, the head walls and then the bathroom pods, which, you know, th those never really, uh, those are interesting, everybody gets all excited about bathroom pods, I don't know why, but um, you know, it's interesting, but uh, I thought the more, uh, more sort of uh, revolutionary aspect of this job was those, was the, the uh, prefabricated corridor racks, these modular racks, right? So we, we had the, all the trades, uh, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, fire protection to an extent, uh, you know, in, in a warehouse, off-site, in a factory-like environment, all working together, building those, those multi-trade racks in a, in a Unistrut system. And that was one of the first times we had done that on this project. What was interesting was that the, uh, the, some of the team members from that project went then to this job, which is, which is happening right now, um, which is down at, uh, oh, you have sound too. This, this makes it so much more exciting when you can hear the guy jacking up the duck. Um, so what it is, is uh, it's a Sibley, it's Sibley Hospital, and uh, well, I guess I shouldn't have named them, right? Uh, Sibley Hospital in Washington. And so the team from Ohio who had done this track, uh, rack system um, then helped out the, uh, our Washington office. So this was a lump sum bid, $80 million job. We, we incorporated this, this scheme and we, we pre-picked uh, the subcontractors, the MEP subs. We came up with this idea, okay, we're going to use this multi-trade rack system in the corridors. And there's, I want to say, 140 modules, about 20 foot long, seven, seven floors of the building. Uh, there's uh, 20 foot long sections, I think seven, I forgot how many, you have to do the math, I guess. Uh, yeah, seven per floor that get uh, built, they were all built off site. So while we were doing excavation and foundations, they were building the MEP systems for the, for the corridor. And they were, so the minute that the space was ready, they were ready to ship these, these, uh, these racks in modular form, pull it. The thing that was interesting was lump sum bid, we planned for this. And we planned for the schedule savings. So there's a, it was several, probably two or three months of a schedule saving. And then there was a cost savings that we assumed as well, two to three million. We put that in our bid. So we, took, we, we accounted for that. And we won the job because of it. And now we're actually delivering it, thank, thank God. It actually, it's actually turns out to be possible. And so, so we are actually delivering this and seems seem fine. It's going in right now. In fact, they're, they're installing all those. So I mention that because this is, this is a, a key sort of turning point is it's now leveraging, leveraging this for a, a, a competitive advantage. You know, now taking all these, you know, we've got these, uh, we've got, you know, sort of the, the people part we're addressing, the process. Now we're saying, look, how, do, how, do, how does this apply both internally and externally to our clients? How do we win work with this? How do we how sort of monetize it, if you will? So I want to end with this, uh, with this section on, on um, purpose, you know, why we're doing this, because again, I think that's critical. It's this, there's a direction, there's a vision behind this. It's a, it's a, it is trying to become a, a strategy. I want you to pay attention to this video, uh, if you could, because I want to I talk to you about this in a minute.
So I, I, was, I was actually making that video one night, and my wife saw it, and she goes, you're not going to really show the, that chick killing a, a cute bunny rabbit. I said, that's the best part. <laughs> <laughs> like, no, absolutely. <laughs> So what's interesting, right, when I was a kid, I was absolutely fascinated with cheetahs. I was, to this day, it's one of my favorite, uh, favorite animals. And I saw this, uh, I saw a study that came out last year that, that, uh, that absolutely uh, was, uh, was fascinating for me because I, and it speaks to, to um, you know, sort of why, our purpose and why we're doing what we're doing. You know, the cheetah's interesting, right? It's, um, we always think about it as, as this, it's fast, right? Fastest land animal, 60, 65 miles an hour. Um, what this, this, there was a team of scientists uh, who uh, uh, tagged uh, a cheetah with uh, GPS accelerometers, and you know, I don't even want to ha ask how they, how, they, how, they, how, they, how they got them on them, but they got them on them, and they attracted uh, you know, uh, some cheetahs hunting. And, and what was fascinating was it wasn't the speed which made them successful. It was into, but even more interesting, cheetahs also decelerate faster than they accelerate. They, 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 they slow down. Quickly, they they also are perfectly adapted. That um, their paws, I, you saw that in the maybe you saw in the video that uh, they're the only cat that actually extends its claws when it when it runs. And so what it allows it to do is is, is grip the ground and turn. Same thing with its its bone structure is is, is um, evolved to be strong to take that impact of, of the deceleration and the turning. And so it's an it's an interesting thing because again, the cheetah is its success is its ability to pivot, its ability to change. Uh, it's perfectly adapted to that. It, and you notice when, it, when it's chasing that rabbit, right? It's, it, it's, all, it's always aligned with it. It's perfectly in alignment. It's always watching it, right? It's, tr it's trying to keep track of it. And, and, and so it's, uh, it, it's got that sort of laser focus. So it's a, um, and I think that I use that as a metaphor for what we're trying to do. It's not about, you know, it's not for us about, um, it's not about being fast or cheap. It's about staying close to our customers, the, that, that maximum agility to react to what a customer values and deliver that value uh, in, the, in the most sort of streamlined, effective way possible. And I, I always use this quote from Peter Drucker because I think it distills the essence of, 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 of what a company is about. You're, 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 the purpose of your company is to capture and keep customers. Everything thereafter is, is meant to, to get you there. So when I look at, at BIM, I, I look, or even also at Lean and other things, it's all in that context of how does this help me be more agile, how does it help me stay close to the client, deliver value, and be effective. It, and uh, the, uh, you know, there's, there's times, I, I look at that video sometimes and I also have the, I have this, uh, you know, sometimes I have a reaction, like I start to feel like I'm the rabbit, you know, because some, some days, you know, certainly when you're on a job site, sometimes you always feel like you're being chased versus versus chasing. And so it, it's also a metaphor for, you know, sort of what do you want to be? Uh, do you want to be that, uh, that uh, forward-thinking, agile uh, firm that, that is way out ahead of your competition and playing to win, or, or are you the rabbit that's just playing not to lose? And, and, and if you want to win, then the, the, what you have to do is you have to start looking at, uh, again, the, the tools, the innovations, the process, the people as a, as a uh, as a framework for how you're going to achieve uh, th those results that you're trying to, uh, trying to uh, uh, get to and, and what you identified. So again, the, I'll close with that reminder, uh, the, this, this framework, this uh, P3 type framework, right? The, the people, process, and purpose. When those are, when those are working, when they're in sync, uh, th th there's amazing uh, uh, results that you can achieve. And, and I think there's uh, hu huge opportunities for, for any firm that's, that's again, go playing to win, that's out in front and, and willing to be a leader. So I'll end on that. Thank you.